mail, and then if you are not there, I think all the person here is there, already access this website, but invite your friends to uh, connect uh, with us, because if, for us it's very important to have a strong community, then connect to them. Uh, because, for example, if you would like it then to give a talk in the next meetup, I think in January or February, ask us, ask me, ask Pavel, because you can schedule another, and if every person, because it, one guy in my company uh, asked me about this, and it's very interesting, another person can hear and give you a, a talk. Then, uh, first we started, here is uh, all my contacts. My website is this, joanjuno.org. You can access this presentation there, for example. I think it's, you have the address. The only joanjuno.org slash presentation is that's the name of this talk in the slug name. Uh, okay, uh, here is my email. If you'd like to ask something in this talk and do you forget to ask today, or if you'd like to give me a feedback or another question, do you send me an email? And here is my another contact, so you can send me a message. I am from Brazil. I, today I work, I live in the working mount. I work in Catena Media. We have the open positions uh, in Python. And if you'd like to, or your friends to work in Catena Media, please send me a message. Uh, and it, before I start, the last. Here, I will not speak about how to scale a crawler because the first you uh, scale a crawler is necessary to understand what is the problem when do you create a crawler. And then I will resolve this problem here in this talk. I will speak about the options in Python, what is possible do you do. Then here we will speak about how to use I.O. efficiently in Python. Then uh, how to use block I.O. and non block I.O. to resolve this type of problem. Okay, then we will start it. Here is the overview of the presentation. Uh, first, we will start a conversation about how to create a faster crawler. It's necessary you uh, discuss a little about the paradigms program, and then we will speak about what is sequential, what is parallelism, and what is concurrent program. And then we will view the differences between these three models. And after this, to create a crawler, it's necessary to understand the two what is the type of problem, what is a CPU bounding problem, and what is IO bounding problem. And after you see this, you will see examples in Python in how to create a good crawler from one request to one million requests. And then we will show the comparator these options and what is the best or no in many of situations. Then we will start it. What is the programming paradigm, sequential versus parallelism versus concurrent. We start with sequential. What is a sequential code? A sequential code is a code that you uh, run one task after another. And then, as can you see here, uh, first we run the task one, and you only start the task two after the task one finish. And in this is it. Uh, and you start the task three only after the task two finish. And here, if you see, this is not very efficient because the total sum, of the runtime here is the sum of eight tasks. And then you need to sum out, in this example, this is 30, 30 seconds to finish all the tasks. But if you think, uh, you have a lot of examples in this in the real life. For example, if you take a shower and you have a lunch, this type of uh, problem is uh, sequential tasks because it's not possible Okay, for normal people, take a shower and have a lunch. It's necessary to finish take a shower after do you have a lunch. It's not possible to make the two. And in computer programming, for example, do you have a lot of examples too? We can think about the uh, crawler web page and then parse this web page. This is sequential because it's not possible for you to start the parser if you don't finish the download of the page. Here is the same question is valid. What is parallelism? Parallelism is when do you uh, oh. more than one task in the same times. As you can see in this example, the task now one, two, and three run in the same time. Then this is more efficient because you don't, it's not necessary do you wait to one task to finish to start another task. Do you run all the tasks here together? But Short, if it's possible, only if you have more than one CPU in your machine. If you don't have more than one CPU in your machine, it's not possible to run parallelism code. 
uh, in the real life, do you have a lot of tasks that is parallel to, for example, you are, you conversation in the phone doing you are walking, for example, and in com computer science, do you have a lot of examples? Uh, for example, in combinatorial optimization problem, is necessary do you calculate a lot of times a inverse of a matrix, and this uh, is very parallel if you think in, in how to calculate the matrix of uh, the inverse of one matrix. Uh, and here, the same question is valid. What is concurrent? The people, uh, I posted this slide because the people confuse a lot what is parallelism and what is concurrent. And the, the difference is, is easy, but it's a little tricky here. The concurrent is when do you have uh, progress in different tasks in the same time. Repetition. In parallelism, do you run more than one task in the same time? But in concurrent programming, do you don't run the tasks in the same time? But you have a progress in many tasks in the same time. As this example, uh, we started in the task one, process a little the task, and then we interrupt the task one and then change for, change for the task three, process a little the task three, and change for the task two and process a little. This uh, is the key uh, concept about uh, how do you use the IO non-block in your machine. Because if you think when do you run uh, one program, for example, and you make uh, one IO, IO is read a file, write a file, or make a request to an API, by default, this uh, call is um, blocking. What is blocking? You call the, this I.O. in your program, and then your task is in the CPU, but you call to write a file. Your task continues in the CPU until the I.O. finish. Then this is blocking. Why? Because it's possible to you process another thing, but you, you is waiting for the, the I.O. finish to continue your process then this is very inefficient because if you uh, waiting, you lost the time. It's possible then do you change for another task uh, until you finish your I.O., for example. And then is the little K, the main K in the non-blocking I.O. If you think in the, the life, the life for me is very concurrent because all the days have 24 hours and you have a lot of uh, tasks that you would like to do. For example, you study in the morning, you work in the morning, and you study in the afternoon. Do you have, if you think in one year, do you have a progress in your work and in your university, but you don't study, study and work in the same time? And then this is about concurrent. The, the big difference in the concurrent in parallelism is exactly this. In parallelism is how do you can uh, process more than one task in the same time. And the concurrent is about how do you manage your time to run a lot of tasks. Okay, now you understand what is the concurrent and the parallelism and sequential coding for creating a good crawlers. It's necessary to understand the two types of problems. Basically in computer science, we have these two types of problems only. The first is the CPU bound. As the name is say, of course, it is when do you use more CPU than I.O. in your program. And you ask, yeah, okay, this is good, but what is the example for this? The example is in, when I say uh, in combinatorial optimization, that's necessary that you calculate a lot of the inverse of the matrix. And this operation is only in the CPU. It's not used I.O. Do you don't write a file, do you don't write a file, do you want to calculate? And this is run only in the CPU. This is the type of CPU bounding problem. Another interesting problem, and we, when you, you calculate the Fibonacci number, for example, this only use the CPU, it's not about IO. And what is IO bounding problem? The IO bounding problem, as name suggests too, is when do you program use more IO, IO than CPU. But okay, giving me one example. How, when, do you, when you, for example, read on file, write on file, or if you make a request in a API, do you use IO body? Because when do you use network, do you use uh, IO? Then this 
is the main topic uh, in this uh, presentation. We then we will speak about the IO bounding problems here. We will show the crawler, but we will speak about the blocking IO and non-blocking IO. When do you use one and when do you use another? And what is the difference with this? And what is the performance of this in Python to make it until one million requests? Okay, then you understand what is the IO bounding problems and the, the type of problems here. And now it's necessary to understand in Python what, what library you use, what is possible to do in Python. And then for IO bounding problems with Python here, we can use parallelism and concurrency. I put parallelism here because I will explain in code. Uh, first, do you know what is the best or better unique, I think, uh, option in Python to use the parallelism when I speak about IO problem? Do you know what is the option? The full? Yes, exactly this. Multiprocessing. When do you use parallelism to resolve I.O. I.O. bounding problems? Uh, the parallelism in Python is possible. Do you use uh, the multiprocess? What is a multiprocess? A multiprocess is when do you create more than one process uh, in your machine to process your tasks. When do you want to program? This is uh, a process. Then do you create more than one process? And then do you have a multiprocessing? And then do you have a lot of tasks in this uh, process to to run. This is about multiprocessing Python. And in concurrency, what options you can, ah, of course, the multiprocess here in Python by default is blocking IO. When you make one call to write a file, to read a file, this block that I uh, uh, explained before. The, your process in the CPU, call to read a file, then the CPU continue working until your IO finish. For, continue, for concurrent programming here for IO bounding problems, you have today three good options. The first option here is the async IO. Async IO is the new in Python. It starts in Python 3.4. And what is async IO? Async IO resolve, resolve exactly the problem that I say about the blocking IO. Because the blocking IO is very inefficient. If you use this, it's very, very inefficient because you lost a lot of time in the CPU. And the CPU, time of CPU is money. Then do you lost a lot of money if you using blocking IO? Of course, I explained, have a lot of tasks that is naturally sequential. For example, if you uh, have one task that depends on others, not possible do you use. But when it's, when it's possible, it's, uh, it's better do you use the non-blocking IO. What is the sync IO then? The sync IO resolve this problem the problem that the blocking IO. Then async IO is non-blocking IO. And the, how the async IO resolve this? Basically, the async IO is an uh, event loop. Uh, what is an event loop? Basically, a for. Then do you have a queue? And do you have a for? Then what does this for do? This for gets the first task in this queue. It started to processing. And you have a specific keyword to show for the uh, event loop, you stop your uh, tasks. When do you stop? When do you make an IO? This is a big uh, trick here. When do you will make an IO? You put a wait, that is the keyword, and this keyword say for the uh, event loop, hey, remove my task from the CPU, the CPU until I finish the IO, and put me again in the queue. And then event loop, remove your task, put in a queue and get another task to process. And this is the idea. Do you not lost more time now? Because when do you make an IO, it's a non-blocking IO. Do you remove your task, put in a queue, process another task. When do you uh, finish the IO, get your task again and continue to process. Then you use the CPU only when necessary. It's a very good idea here. Uh, there are other uh, options that you have here is the G event. What is G event? G event, async IO works only in Python 3 because it starts in Python 3.4. G event works in Python 2 and Python 3. If you use Python 2, stop to use because <laughs> in, in one year we will stop to, to continue this at the support. Thanks. Uh, and then we stop to use this. I think that have you any parts that use Python 2? It's not very common because in, 
one or two years ago is common, but now it's not. The G event works. G event is a very, very, very easy uh, library to use in Python. Why? Because what is this? This is first, this is a, a green thread. What is a green thread? The difference a green thread and a real thread. The green thread uh, is controlled by a software, and the, a real thread is controlled by oper operational system. Then it's not a real thread, but it's a green thread. It's controlled by a software. They go out to the software, this library, G event. And what does this library do? It's, I will show, this is very simple to use. You import this library, and then do you call a monkey patch, for example. And the, what did this do? This uh, change all your IO, uh, your blocking IO, for a non-blocking IO call. And then this uh, have a very, very similar event loop to manage your IO calls. And after this, and in the last, do you have the other option here to concurrent in Python? Async IO is an event, is non-blocking, and now you have a threading. And if people think in this, when you say threading is concurrent, people think, oh, not good. Because why do you think uh, threading is not concurrent? Because when you learn threading, the people say for us that the thread is parallel, is not concurrent. And this is true, but in Python, you have the global interpret lock. The global inter what global interpret lock do? The global interpret lock uh, ensure that the only one thread run in the CPU in the same time. And then this is not real parallel. This is concurrent because you run one thread. Uh, and if you have two threads we, uh, in the same time, we uh, only run one thread. When you finish, change for another thread. This is concurrent, this is not parallel. But people think, ah, okay, then the global interpret lock is a problem for us. It is not a problem if you use IO bounding problems. If you use CPU bounding problems, it is a problem in Python. Why? Because, for example, if you have uh, eight cores in your machine, if you create, and then you think, yeah, okay, I will create 80 threads to process uh, more quickly, uh, but if you make this in CPU bounding problem, the global interpret lock uh, is a problem for you because the global interpret lock ensures that the only one thread is run in the CPU. But for a your bounding problem is different. Why is different? Because you continue with this, but automatically the uh, global interpret lock, when you make one uh, call of IO, uh, the global interpret lock remove your thread from the CPU put another thread until the I.O. finish. Then it's very, very similar what we do in async I.O. I think that async I.O. get this idea from the, the thread. And then the thread for I.O. is a non-blocking I.O. if you will think about the concept. Then it's okay. Uh, we know, already understand what is the uh, parallelism, concurrency, uh, and the sequential code. You already know about the CPU body and the IO body. Do you classify our problem? Then you will write a crawler. Then a crawler is a IO body problem, and you have only one problem when you write a, a crawler. That is, I will make a lot of IO, and then what is the best problem to manage this IO? Then I will give uh, examples in Python how to use this. And if to show the examples, I will create this uh, simple API. Why I don't uh, crawl a uh, website here? Because I will show the examples and we will make uh, one minute uh, of requests and then block our IP, then I created this. This uh, API is uh, a very simple app flask. And the end point faster, you will wait one second and you return only this. And in the end point slowly, we will wait 10 seconds in the returning. And in the last end point of this API is a slash text. We will only return a simple text. This is the code of this API. This is a very simple. In the first two lines, we import the libraries that is necessary. In the line four here, we create the app, the app Flask. In the line five, we will define our time, one in the 10 seconds. Uh, from the line seven uh, until the line nine uh, here, we create the endpoint dot first, only sleep in the return, uh, sleep in one second in returning. And from the line 11 to line 13, you define the slowly endpoint. That is very simple too. 
and from the line uh, 15 uh, to 17, we will define the uh, endpoint text. Okay, then we will show the crawlers now, the examples in Python, how to uh, crawler this uh, for API. Firstly, I will show the crawler sequential with blocking IO. What is this? Uh, in the first line, we import the library request. The request is a library in Python for you make HTTP requests. Uh, in the third line, I import a constant here, only the URL. Uh, from the line five until the line seven, we define our crawler. The crawler is a very simple. What is this? You make a get HTTP request in this URL and then return the status codes, only this. And from the line nine until the line 12, you call this crawler. In sequential, you will crawl the first with the endpoint slowly. And after this, we will call uh, 20 times the crawler with the URL faster. This uh, is very inefficient. And what is the total time to run this? Is the 10 seconds for the first call and 20 seconds in the second call, and then the total is 30 seconds. I will show uh, how to run this here. Screen. It's good? Yeah. Okay, first thing. I will only uh, run the, the, this code is in the GitHub, in the final I will show the, what is the help for you get the code, but I will run the app Flask then. Here you can see the same, this app file is the same that I showed there. I will run this. Then this is the, the server. Only run, and then now I will run the crawler here. Now I will run, and everything is okay. In the final, you will consume me uh, 30 seconds because you make the first call, that is 10 seconds, and after this, we call the crawler 20 times uh, in the eight time is one second, and in the total, do you have this? This is a blocking I.O. Why? Do you make the first call for the API, and the API will uh, uh, wait 10 seconds? Then it's very inefficient, because it's possible for you, do your task is running in the CPU, and do you are waiting? And then if you is more uh, smart, you can change this. Uh, what I say, it's uh, 30 seconds, very, very simple to run. And now you can see the same crawler here, but now with concurrency with threads. That is very simple too. In the first, uh, the first, uh, second, and the third line, we imported the, the libraries in Python. Here we import the thread to use. Uh, in the line from five until seven, we, you define our, our crawler. Basically, it's the same as the first. We only make an HTTP request in the endpoint and then return the status code. Uh, in the line nine here, now it's different because you create one thread to run the crawler with the endpoint slowly. And in the line 10 and 11, you call the, uh, you create the, the threads to run the, uh, the crawler with the endpoint faster. The same that before, but now with threads. And in the line 12 and 13, you call this crawler to start, the, this thread to start it. And in the final line here, 14 and 15, you say for the program, wait until all the threads finish. I will run this after now. Here is the crawling concurrency, the crawling concurrency with green threads now. It's very, very similar. Uh, in the first line, first, second, three, and four, we only import the libraries. And in the line five here is a little trick of this uh, library that I say for you. What did this line make? This line change all your blocking IO calls for non-blocking IO calls. Then if you would like to start it, if you have uh, a crawler or something similar, and do you like to test non-blocking IO, this is a very good library to start it because only with this line is possible do you change the blocking IO for non-blocking IO. Of course, it is necessary that you change 
more think if you would like to uh, get more performance. But with this, it's possible to start it. In the, from the line seven until nine, you create the crawl. Basically, it's the same. Uh, you uh, make a HTTP request in the endpoint and then return the status codes. But now, in the line 11 here, you create one green thread uh, to run the crawler with the endpoint slowly. And in the line 12 and the 13, you create the uh, 20 uh, green threads to run the crawler with the endpoint faster. After this, in the line 13, as before, uh, we call all the, the green threads to run here. And in the line 15, you wait until all the, the green threads stop. But this is the green thread, it's not a thread. This is controlled by the software, not by the operational system. This is the difference. It's here. After this uh, green thread, then you, you see the, this is no blocking IO. And this is the crawler with async IO, no blocking IO2. This is, I think, the best option in Python because this is the new and they have a lot of improving in this, a lot of person working in the new Python 3.7. The documentation of this library is fantastic because it two, one or two months ago, uh, a lot of person working in this and improved the documentation. And now it's very easy to use. Basically here in the line of one, two and three, we import the libraries. The first library here is the async IO, but the second library here is different. I don't import requests because the request is blocking IO, then I import a library in Python that is very similar. Make the same idea of request, but with non-blocking IO. This is IO HTTP. Uh, and here in the line from uh, five until eight, we define our crawler. And here is a little different from before, because if you see here, you have two different words that the, you see before that is a sync and the await. The async here is the keyword in Python for you defining a coroutine. And this is a coroutine. Basically, the coroutine is a sum function that you return in the future. And the, the line here in the seven, await. Await is the instruction that I say for you uh, to say for the event loop, remove your task from the CPU and put another task. Remove your task, put in a queue, put another task in the CPU until the IO finish. This is a very, very interesting idea and very, very easy to run. Uh, then in the line 10, I get the default event loop because the async IO uh, already give for you a basic, basically event loop, but it's possible you change it and I will show what is the another options to change this and the another option exists, another option more efficient, but I speak of this uh, after. In the line 11 here, you create a task to run uh, the crawler you, with endpoint slowly. And in the line 12 and 13, you create 20, uh, 20 tasks to run the crawler with the endpoint faster. And in the last line here, you call this loop to run all the tasks and the response for us. Very, very simple. And here is the last crawler. The last crawler is with multiprocessing. I put it parallel here because I forget to speak, but here is more good to explain this. Because do you know when multiprocess, because multiprocessing is parallel, but sometimes uh, multiprocess is parallel and concurrent. And do you know when this is parallel and when do you is concurrent? Do you know any ideas? This, uh, when do you, for example, if you create uh, the number of the process is uh, less than the number of CPU in your machine, then is parallel. But if you, for example, if, uh, have only eight cores in your machine and do you create 16 process, this is not only parallel, this is parallel and concurrent because eight process run until eight process is waited to run. Then it's parallel and concurrent in the same time. And the problem here is this code is blocking IO2. But in the first three lines, we import the, in the first three lines here, we import the libraries. And the line from five until seven, you only define the crawler. It's the same crawler, but the difference is here in the line nine, you create a pool of the, the process with 21. This parameter say how many process I would like to create, and then the interpreter of the Python. Uh, for the process for you, I will create 21. 
Then I create a list with the endpoint slowly and put it uh, 20 times the uh, endpoint faster in this list. And in the final line here, I, I say for the uh, interpreter of the Python, run the crawler with this list and give me the result. Basically, is this. And here, now, you can see the benchmarks uh, about this. You make three benchmarks to compare with these solutions in Python. Uh, the first benchmark is a very, very simple benchmark. What we do is the code that I show here. We make one request in the URL in the endpoint slowly and 20 requests in the endpoint faster. What we do this, we do this only to verify the options, what this, uh, the, the behavior of this and what is good or not good. After this, then is more interesting. Now you will make uh, 10,000 requests uh, with the API, but the batch size of this, uh, this request is uh, 100 requests each time. And in the last benchmark, we will make one, uh, 1 million requests in the API, in the endpoint text, and the, the batch size of this is uh, 1,000 requests. It is to show what is the best option to uh, work when you work in I.O. Uh, Python uh, problems. Uh, in the first benchmark, uh, here we run the crawlers only the crawlers with threads, with green threads, as in I.O. multiprocess. If you think here, we remove the sequential code. Why you remove? Because sequential code is very, very slow and you don't scale. Then we remove for this, you already show that it's very, very slow. For example, if you run green, green, the threads of green thread here, you, the same example, only 10 seconds. But uh, with the sequential, you give it 30 seconds to run. For example, if I run here, the same crawler but with threads, for example. It is the same example, one uh, call in the endpoint faster and the 20 calls in the endpoint slowly, but now uh, with thread. And then this is consuming uh, only 10 seconds. It's the same, if you see the code here, for example. It's the same that before, but now only with thread. And from uh, 30 seconds to 10 seconds. It's a very good. But then, in the first benchmark, we run five graphs. Why five graphs? Because we run these in five days. I will explain why in the final. And in eight days, we run this uh, 100 times. And here is the graph to show the results. This is a box plot graph. People understand what is a box plot graph? Yes, I will explain them to uh, this is a very, 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 very simple graph and very interesting. Why it's very interesting? Because it is very easy to use summarize your data. What is summarized, for example, here is very easy to, do you know what is the minimal and the maximum and the difference about this? Because if you hear in the first graph here, if you see here, the difference between the minimum and the maximum uh, is very, very visual. And then do you show here and do you see that for the crawler with threads, do you have the minimal value is very, very similar to the maximum value because the difference here is very small. But if you show here in the multiprocess, do you see that the, uh, the difference between the minimum and the maximum value is not more small, now is big. And then this is not very good for you. And the another interesting idea in this type of graph that the, you can see the outlier in your data. And then it's very simple uh, uh, to you see a lot of data in one, one simple graph. Here is about uh, 100 data. Very simple to see. And okay, now you know what is this type of graph. You then conversation about what is this graph say and what is this result. The first, uh, the first here is about the thread. I don't know if you uh, read this, but this is thread, this is multiprocessing, this is green thread, and this is async IO. Okay, in the first graph, you see here, and they have a, lot, a very interesting result here. Why is this interesting result? Uh, about the thread. The thread here is the more fast. And the people say, hey, 
People say for me that the Python have a problem with threads because the global interpreter lock, it's a problem. But I explained for you, it's a problem if you run the CPU bounding problem. If you run IO bounding problem, it's not uh, a big problem. Of course, for example, if you have eight cores in your machine and you use it in IO bounding problem, Python don't use the eight cores. But when you call the IO, Python remove your threads and put another thread. And you see here, this is very, very efficient. This is more efficient than for this, of course, this simple example for the async IO and for green threads. But here in the same graph, do you see a problem with the threads? What is, do you have a big outlier? Because, why? Because you, uh, when you use threads, you don't have the control in your range. The control is in the operational system. The operational system decides when put one thread or another thread in uh, to run. And then do you don't control this. If you, for example, run the same uh, benchmark here, but if you use the CPU a lot, probably this graph could change a lot because the control is not in your hands, in, in the operational system. And here, another, the multiprocessing is the slowly. You are already thinking, this is true because the first is this is IO blocking and the second idea because creating processing is very, very expensive. It's more expensive than creating threads, for example. And here, the green threads and the async IO is very, very similar because the idea is the same. The difference of green threads and the async IO that the green threads you don't control uh, when change the context, but with async IO, you say for your program, hey, I'd like to remove my task and the pattern another. But in this graph is very, very similar, the result. Here is the second graph in the second day. Uh, you can see the same results. The thread is the faster. The multiprocessing is the slowly. The green thread and the sync IO is very, very similar again. But now, uh, but continue, the threads have a big outlier. That's a problem for us. If you, for example, work in a task that is very important for you and you would like to know what is the maximum time to wait, it's not a good idea to use this. Here is the result for the, the day three. And you can see the threads is the faster again. The multiprocessing is the slowly again, but now the multiprocess change. Why this change, if you think here? Because in multiprocessing, we will have the same problem with the threads. You don't define when the computer uh, put your program to run because the operational system uh, controls this. And I think that in this time, the, my computer run another thing. I run this in the night, but sometimes run another, another code. Uh, and the green threads in AsyncIO is very, very similar. If you see threads, continue have the, uh, a big uh, outlier. And here is the same result for the day, for the day four the threads continue uh, the faster, the multiprocess continue the slowly, the threads continue to have a uh, big outlier and the green threads and the async IO is very, very similar again. Here is the day four, the threads is the faster again, but now the outlier is more big. What's happened here? You don't know because you don't control. The operational system control for you, then this is a big problem for you. The multiprocessing is the slowly, and the, again, the green threads in the async IO is very, very similar. But if you see the numbers, of course, here is the resume about this data. If you see the threads is the, the best, but the values is very, very similar. Why is very, very similar? Because this is a very simple example. You only make it 21 requests. Okay, do you make 21 requests? If you use threads, if you use green threads, async IO multiprocess, is very, very uh, similar. But in the last column, the first column here, you have the same of the, the, the crawler, the second uh, in the minimal uh, of all the runtime, and in the column three is the maximum, and in the column four is the difference between the maximum and the minimal. And in the last column here, you have this difference, but divided by, uh, divided by the minimal uh, multiply by 10, then this is a percentage. If you see in the threads and the multi-thread, do you have a big difference here in percentage? And in green threads and the sync IO is very, very similar. Why? 
because in async IO, for example, you control when you change the context of your task. Then do you have more control? Do you not have a big and a small? Do you run and the, uh, during all the time, do you have the same response if you are in the point? Response in the same time, of course. It's the first and okay. The very, very simple benchmark. And now you will make a more good benchmark. You will make now 10,000 requests in this endpoint. The batch size is uh, 100 requests. What is the batch size? You make this call in parallel. And then you will uh, show the results for threads, green threads in the sync IO. Why you will remove multi process here? Because in the first example is the slowly. Do you have the same five graphs, but now uh, not 100 uh, runs, only five, 50 runs, because this is more slow, do you make more requests? And if you see here, the same graph box plot, but now change a lot. Why change? Because the first here is the result for async IO, the second is the green thread, and the last is thread. In the first example, that is very simple, the thread is more faster. But now, if you increase your problem, the async IO is more efficient. Why? Because now you control, you uh, make a lot of requests and you control when change the tasks, the, the tasks in, in the CPU. This is very, very efficient. The another interesting idea here, that is green threads and the threads is very, very similar. I don't expect the result, but this is very interesting for us. Here is the same for the second day. Do you have the same results? If you see the async IO, the async IO is faster and very, very similar with the uh, results before. Uh, here is the same graph for the day three. In this, uh, async IO continues the faster and do you have the green threads and the threads is very, very similar. For day four, continues the same result. For day five, the same result. And now the green threads and the threads is very identical. Very, very. And here is the resume about this. Uh, we have the same table, but now the async IO is more faster. The thread now is the slowly. And now you have a, a real difference between this. If you see um, the minimal value for async IO in 110 and for threads, it's more. And in the last, uh, before we run the code here, uh, is the benchmark three. What is this benchmark? This benchmark, we already know that the, uh, in the benchmark two, that the async IO is more efficient to work with this type of problem. But uh, think if it's possible, do you improve the async IO? It's possible, it's possible if you change async IO. Then I will change the base event loop for the UV loop. UV loop is a very efficient uh, base event loop for uh, async IO because I explained that you can change the default. And here you make 1 million requests. Uh, the batch size of the request is 1,000. You will make the five graphs, but now it's five uh, rounds per graph because it's 30 minutes to run 80 benchmark here. And here is the, the same graph. And in the first, you can see the uh, async IO with UV loop. And in the second, you can see the async IO. Then the async IO with UV loop is more fast, is the first. The second graphic here, the same result, the UV loop is more faster. In the third graphic here, you can see the same result. For day four, you can see the same, but a little different. In the five, the UV loop is the first. And here, you can see the resume about this. Okay, the resume about this is the UV loop is more faster than, uh, than the, 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 the full event loop. And then I will show for you how to run this code if you would like to get this in the GitHub. Uh, here, we already run the, for the uh, crawler with threads. Then I will run now for the crawler with uh, green threads, for example. I expected the same result that we have in the, the threads and more faster than the sequential that I show, about 10 seconds. 
Yes, 10 seconds. If you see here, the threads is more efficient in the small problem, of course. And now I will run the same problem with the async IO. I expect 10 seconds too, because you make this uh, concurrent mode and you remove your task when necessary. And you have the control in your range. Yes, is a little um, less efficient than green threads and threads, but is more efficient than sequential in a, si in a simple problem. And now we can run for 10,000 requests. Yeah. Do you go for this here? Uh, crawler with many requests. This is here, for example. Oops, I need to uh, put the server in there. Go here. You run for the, this is the server for the first example, and then this is the, the server for the second example. The difference is between the number of the workers here. Okay, then now I think this is about a two minutes. I don't remember. I think it's this. And here, what do we do? We do 10,000 requests in the endpoint faster, but with threads, I think this is two minutes. We can verify when we finish. The time is here. Until we finish, we continue here. After we run the another, uh, here, before I finish, what is the code? If you use the sequential code here, is it to scale? No, because sequential code don't scale. You use this, of course you use, because sometimes you need to use this, but it's not scale. You have uh, your control? No, you don't have, because in, when you use this, is uh, blocking IO. Then you don't have the control. And the context suite here is about the operation system. In multiprocessing, is it scale? No. Why? Because you have the maximum number of, uh, of process that you have in your machine, then this is not easy. It's not easy to share the memory in this process, then this is not easy to scale. Do you have your control? No, because the IO control here is operational system. Do you have the block, continue have blocking IO? After this, in the thread, threading is scale, it's not very easy. You can scale, but it's not very easy. Why? Because, for example, when you necessary in one task, do you call another task uh, with thread? It's the code is a spaghetti code because you create a lot of threads inside the threads inside the threads, and do you forget? And it's not very easy to scale. It's not a very good idea. Do you don't have the control here about the IO? But this option is the non-block IO because the global interpret lock in Python remove your thread. Uh, for the G event, that is the green thread, it's easy to scale, very easy, very easy to use, very easy to scale. IO control, not in your hand, but in the application and the context switch application in the operational system. And if, if for a sync IO, is very easy to scale, very uh, easy to use. You can create one inside another and the, uh, one coroutine inside another coroutine. It's very easy to make this. It's possible to you get the result. It's not the, uh, the, this problem is uh, with threads, but not with a sync IO. Do you have the IO control in your range? Why? Because of the instruction, the KO that they say await, do you say for the process, hey, remove my for event loop, remove my task and put another, and the context switch in your range and the SEO. Uh, I think that finish here. Yes, it's two minutes and 20 seconds. I will run the same here, but with the green threads, for example. Uh, you can see here, the first is the help of this talk. All the information is there. If you see, I think it's here, yes. It is the help of this talk. Do you rev all the code that I show here is this? Uh, do you rev a readme here? Route run, uh, 
how to install all the libraries. It's necessary that you use Python 3 here, but you only install all the libraries in requirements and the only this, and then it's, it's possible that you run this code in, in your house. If you have any problems or if you have doubts, ask me or send me an email, no problem. Here. It's the official documentation, but I think I.O., threading, multiprocessing, and a lot of uh, libraries that I use here. Uh, again, the official documentation of AsyncIO is a very, very good, uh, changing a lot. If you use this in Python 3.6, uh, read again, because in the Python 3.7, uh, it's very, very easy to, to read and understand. In Python 3.6, it's not very easy to understand if you don't uh, work with the non-blocking IO, but in Python 3.7, it's very easy to read this. Uh, I would like to distract this, this talk, understand the, the Python global interpret lock about the David. It's a very, very interesting talk and they explain how the global interpret lock works in Python. What is the problem this resolving? Uh, when do you use this? What is the problem for the CPU bounding? And the, what is not the problem for IO bounding? It's a very, very interesting talk. And if, uh, in the last here is a very, very good talk. If you run benchmarks and the, the timing is essential for you. The, this uh, talk is necessary for you. The route to run a stable benchmarking because when you run, if you see the slides, for example, a thread and multiprocess, sometimes it's very fast, but sometimes it's slow. And in this talk, the Vitor says, uh, how do you configure your machine to run a stable? For example, if you have eight cores, do you do, uh, then stop it? six cores to run another task and they run only your task. is a very, very interesting talk. And the, uh, for you, see if you run benchmarks in your machine. Then, if you have any doubts, grazie, guys. Yeah, question? Uh, finish here with the same similar, but the thread is more efficient. I can ask a question. Sure. Uh, so yeah, no <laughs> you basically just use async IO for everything. Is there a reason not to use async IO? I mean, besides being Python 3.4 or not? Uh, if you use it for your problem, it's a very good idea. If you use the CPU bound, it's possible that you use async IO. It's possible. But it's not very, very efficient because you continue in the same problem in Python. If you have eight cores and you use the async IO, you put one task in the CPU, but you don't have IO. Uh, and then it's not possible to use a way to, to remove your task and put there another. Because when you use the CPU bounding, it's necessary your task run in the CPU. It's possible that you make this. It's possible because, for example, sometimes it's interesting. For example, you get, you download a page, but think that the, you crawl a page that have a lot of numbers and do you need to make a lot of calculation with these numbers that you get. Then do you crawl a page, download the page, parse this page and make a lot of calculation. And then it's possible to use a SyncIO to make this and for you not, ah, no, in this point I will use multiprocessing or threads. Then you use only the SyncIO. But for only the uh, CPU bound, for example, if you, ah, you would like to calculate the Fibonacci numbers, I will use the async IO is possible, it's possible, but it's not very efficient. The sequential code in this is more efficient. Thank you for your talk. Um, is there um, any big advantage to using async for any blocking problem over publishing maybe the task on a message queue and writing something in a faster language? Because let's face it, Python is not fast. Yes. Use it not for its speed, use it for its ease of use. Yes, this is what I would like to speak in another talk. It is uh, how to basically how to scale a crawler. Because this, uh, when do you use SyncIO? In the SyncIO is very efficient. When you, I show here, if you only only one machine. Here, if you see the code, I make one uh, one million requests in one machine in thirty minutes. But of course, for example, ah, okay, but I have one billion of pages to crawl. What I do? It's not possible to do, do this in one machine because the time is uh, 
very uh, high. Then what do you do? Do you put this in a lot of machines? And for example, in the Celerai, do you make this? But it's possible that you use the AsyncIO and the Celerai in the same uh, problem. And then do you use more efficient in one machine? And then do you put in more machine uh, with the Celerai? And you continue uh, be more efficient because in eight, for example, you have 10, 10 workers in the Celerai. And if you use in the eight work, your function use the AsyncIO, you are more efficient. And if you compare it only the Celerai without the AsyncIO and the Celerai without the AsyncIO, your function is more perfect. But it's very, very good. I will speak about this in another talk, how to scale up in a lot of machines. Thanks.